you've said in the past, there's, you're not that path to impeachment. Are you still, how do you reconcile those things? But it's things? not off the table. You, you can't, I don't think you should impeach for political reasons, and I don't think you should not impeach for political reasons. It's not about politics. It's not about Democrats and Republicans. It's not about partisanship. It's about patriotism to our country. It's upholding the Constitution of the United States. The House Speaker saying impeachment is not off the table, but New York Democrat Jerry Nadler is going one step further. The House Judiciary Committee chairman has reportedly asked Pelosi to open a formal impeachment inquiry. Our next guest just wrote an opinion piece published in the L.A. Times called The End of Nixon's Presidency Proves Pelosi is Wrong to Wait on Impeachment. Here's a part of it. Quote, just as investigating endlessly without conclusion lets politicians off the hook, so it is an abrogation of responsibility to lob the scandal of the Trump presidency over to the court system. Time is now of the essence. Waiting for weeks and even months for the courts to deliberate and decide questions of obstruction and abuse of power ensures that impeachment will die by October. Impeachment hearings must get underway before the August recess of Congress. After that, he writes, forget about it. Trump will have won. No collusion, no obstruction will be the mantra of the land by fiat. James Reston Jr. is the author of 15 books, including The Conviction of Richard Nixon, The Untold Story of the Frost-Nixon Interviews. His upcoming book about Watergate called The Impeachment Diary will be published in September. James, in your L.A. Times op-ed, you argue that the lessons learned from Watergate, particularly the end of Richard Nixon's presidency, show that Nancy Pelosi's wrong to slow walk impeachment as she's been doing. So let's begin in 1974. What events provide those lessons? What is it that you remember that other people have either overlooked or forgotten? Well, that proceeding started with a vote in the entire full House as to whether there would be a full impeachment hearing. And over 400 congressmen voted for that. And that started a very dignified process that involved a lot of secret um, work on the part of the staff of the Judiciary Committee and also some executive sessions amongst the congressmen. And then came the televised hearings. So it was a very uh, deliberate process and a very dignified one. Um, and I think that uh, by her slow walking this thing, if, if it slow walks it into the fall, it's very likely that the press's interest and uh, the public's interest will be shifting to the campaign itself and impeachment will just die a slow death. You said that Congress acted in a deliberate and dignified manner in 1974, hardly two adjectives that are often used to describe the current Congress. Does that dilute the power of that message? Well, it's going to be harder, given the uh, current climate, to, to be sure, to move to, uh, to a dignified tone. But uh, what's needed here is an official Im impeachment inquiry, and I think that focuses politicians' uh, attention very much on the historic nature of what they would be doing, and knowing also that at the end of this process, they're going to have to look deeply into their soul, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, as to what they really believe and what they really believe about the evidence that is presented against the president. So as long as we don't have uh, that sort of official quality of an in inquiry, there are, uh, congressmen have no, uh, have no problem with just uh, shooting their mouth off on television uh, about anything they want to say. It's not, it does not focus and concentrate their attention on the historic nature of, the, of the, this moment in history. On that focus and concentration, you wrote in your op-ed that voting on impeachment in public, quote, concentrated the mind and the conscience. Investigations alone do not. But Congress and the public certainly weren't as partisan in 1974 as they are today. Look at Justin Amash, the congressman from Michigan. The White House is already working to try to find him a primary challenger because he's come out in support of impeachment. Do you really think the conscience of Republican lawmakers can overcome partisan entrenchment? Well, it's hard for me to imagine that every Republican in Congress is just walking in lockstep with Donald Trump and that they have no problem whatsoever in, in what the Mueller report uh, revealed and what, what uh, else is going to be revealed in this investigative uh, process. 
So, you know, what Republicans say in public, and they're not saying very much, to be sure, um, I think doesn't really, um, doesn't really go to what they're thinking deeply within their soul. And I would hope, as in 1974, there would be some uh, thoughtful Republicans who look at this evidence and are not just going to, uh, in a knee-jerk way, come out for the, for the president's defense. But it's that look into their soul that's juxtaposed against the political realities and the rubber meets the road on Election Day. Uh, fair to say that a lot of Republicans are either afraid, rightly or wrongly, that they'll lose their seats if they come out and oppose Donald Trump. Well, I'm not interested really in, in uh, whether Republicans or Democrats, for that matter, win or lose at the moment. What I'm interested in is the constitutional process. And we have a level of criminality from Donald Trump that exceeds that of any other presidential misconduct in American history. There is a process that is stated by the Constitution about what we go through when we are faced with this kind of thing. And I'm uh, quite keen to see that constitutional process be followed and let the chips fall where they may. Let's go back to 1974. What is it that changed Republican minds, or at least enough Republican minds, to support impeachment in the House? Uh, well, of course, you had the tapes then. And uh, that was an extraordinary body, uh, body of firsthand uh, evidence. We don't have that at the moment. Uh, but we have equivalents of, uh, of tapes. And it was, I think, in the end, very difficult for um, probably all Republicans on the Judiciary Committee to overlook uh, this enormous body of negative uh, evidence and criminal evidence against Richard Nixon. So the same thing exists now uh, if, um, you know, history is watching as uh, as politicians go about their business uh, these days. And uh, every elected f official in Congress is, is going to create a legacy from this summer and in the next uh, year in relation to the criminality of Donald Trump. So they can ignore it and overlook it or um, or whatever it is they want to do, but they will be remembered one way or another of, of how they uh, vote. But then does the effectiveness of your argument hinge on new decisive information coming to light, as it did during the Watergate hearing process? And given our current situation, where we seem to know quite a bit and nobody, a lot of people don't seem to care, do you really think that similarly impactful new information will come to light against Donald Trump? We don't need any more uh, information. The Mueller report is definitive in its uh, laying out of obstruction of justice. The proceedings in the Southern District of New York are going to lay out uh, whatever they're going to lay out. And there is plenty of information now to go forward to construct articles of impeachment. This is the problem with today's world, that everybody is forgetting about what's already happened and looking for the new best thing to come, come along. Uh, I don't think that uh, anything particularly new is going to come out uh, when the redactions in the Mueller report uh, are revealed. We know the essence of, uh, of the case in the Mueller report, and it seems to me the congressmen are called upon to focus on what we have in, ta in hand and to distill that into formal articles of impeachment. Finally, you, you've said that impeachment of President Trump is essentially, and I, I, I'm putting words in your mouth a little bit here, but it's a moral, ethical, and constitutional necessity. Uh, if you will, and 2020 and political decisions be damned. But if somebody looks at the map ahead and says, boy, 2020 could be at risk, maybe we should hold off on impeachment just in case he gets reelected and we can use it again to stop him from another four years. How would you respond to that argument? I would say that that's just uh, ignoring your absolutely essential responsibility as a, as a lawmaker. I mean, we've gone through this process now for two years. And we have a document, and the uh, various committees and uh, congressmen have basically what they need to move forward. Now it's a question of distilling 
what we have into, a, into specific articles of impeachment, and then people can vote for or against it. I'm not saying that necessarily whatever is composed, everybody's going to vote, vote for it, but that is the process that's laid out by the Constitution. Some, some food for thought. James Reston, Jr., appreciate the insight and a few minutes. Thanks very much. You bet. And up next, we're going to take a look at the 2020 race, but not the battle for the White House. Instead, tonight, we're going to focus on the Senate and whether Democrats have a solid opportunity to retake control.